What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be doing the next mission for Laon Aerospace, but it's not really a full mission. This is more like a bonus video because basically I've been very, very, very busy this week and I was a bit ill last week, so I haven't had much chance to play Kerbal Space Program at all. So I originally just was not going to put a video out this week because I really didn't have the time and resources to put a proper video out, but... I was thinking about what the next episode of Laon Aerospace 2, the second one, would be. And the overwhelming consensus of, like, suggestions in the previous episode's comment section was, uh, can you do a mission to Duna? So I thought, okay, a mission to Duna it will be. So I designed a ship for Duna and it, it works and everything. I think I haven't actually tested it yet, but all the maths works out. Um, but when I was uh, coming to constructing the actual booster to get it uh, from the ground into space as boosters generally do um i realized that it looked a bit dumb because i don't actually have any fairing pieces unlocked i assumed i already had unlocked some fairings but i guess i was mistaken i thought this would look better if i had a payload fairing for you know the payload so i had a look at the node i would need to unlock in the tech tree and i'm about 60 science points short so i'm like well let's just do like a little mission just to get to those points so we can unlock the parts so i'm having to think about what to do i've set a rule for this series that i can't get science um, from a planet or moon more than once. So we can't go back to Mimus or Mum to get science. And I don't really want to get science from Kerbin again at this point because although we could do it, it's kind of cheesing it a bit, I think, if we just to go to Kerbin. And, you know, after you've discounted Minmus, Mun, and Kerbin, you're not really left with much else other than Juno, and then we're right back to square one where we don't have a fairing to do a Juno mission. But there is another celestial body that we could get science from very, very easily, and that is the Sun. Obviously, we can't land on the sun, <laughs> uh, but we can at least leave Kerbin's sphere of influence and get into space in orbit high above the sun, do some science and then boost back to Kerbin and return. So that's what we're going to be doing in this episode here. So I apologize that it's not really a full episode, but I wanted to, I thought it'd be a shame to not put any content out at all this weekend. So this is the video that we're going to be doing. So not really a full Matt Lowne Kerbal Space Program video, but a little bonus in lieu of not uploading anything at all. And there we are, the LAN Aerospace Mark VI is ready to go. Hopefully it wasn't too hard to build it along with the video because I played the construction at normal speed after some people last week said that it was a bit too difficult to follow the video. I mean, my suggestion would just be to pause it every so often and just look at it, but just to help out those who struggled, I played this one at regular speed. Now, for the launch, the bulk of our ascent speed is going to be powered by those SRBs. So I'm leaving the throttle at just 50% so we still have the gimbal of the central engine to help steer ourselves. Pointing straight up till you reach about 35 meters per second before gradually commencing our tilt where we're aiming to be pointing 45 degrees by the time we reach 10 kilometers, making sure that our tilt is as smooth and gradual as possible and trying to stay as close to the prograde mark on the nav board as possible just to minimize the amount of aerodynamic stress on the spacecraft. Now, since we have a fairly lightweight payload, this rocket is not actually very big and it's actually really, really easy to fly as well. So if you are struggling with getting into orbit and your general ascents, this is actually a really good rocket to help practice because it flies rock steady because those solid rocket boosters really help keep things on track as well as those fins as well as the vectoring of the central engine. And in terms of the thrust management, you don't have to worry about too much because the SRBs can't be controlled and the central engine can just be left at 50% thrust for the entire ascent. And in fact, that swivel engine is going to get us pretty much all the way into space and we just need to do a circularization burn using the upper stage. And even then, we don't really need to circularize our orbit because we're not aiming to go anywhere. We're just leaving Kevin's sphere of influence and coming straight back. So we can just do our escape burn once we reach our apoapsis. So we're going to open up the map screen and take a look at our apoapsis and see how far away from it we are. Once we're about kind of a minute, 50 seconds to a minute, which is now, I guess, we can start pointing directly prograde so that our rocket will gradually start tipping over towards a more flat trajectory so we can focus on getting all of our horizontal velocity built up because right now our surface speed is only about 900 meters per second and that needs to be quite a bit faster in order for us to remain in orbit so that's going to be the next step is just pointing prograde just to ensure that we can pick up enough speed to stay in orbit now the reason why we're not flying flat at this point is because we are still in the atmosphere and although the atmosphere up here is very thin you can still see it significant enough to cause the flames to be lapping the side of the rocket so if we started burning completely flat and just working on horizontal velocity we'd end up wasting far too much fuel fighting the air resistance not to mention putting bob's capsule under immense heating pressure 
we don't want to be doing that. So we want to be still putting a little bit of speed into our ascent to make sure that we're actually still going to gain enough altitude to make it to space. But as the atmosphere gets thinner and thinner, we can start gradually pointing ourselves closer and closer to a flat trajectory, which is fairly easily accomplished by just continuing to hold the prograde marker. And you can see that's kind of naturally drifting towards a horizontal plane by itself. So looking at the map screen, we can see our apoapsis is now above the atmospheric line, which in Kerbal Space Program is 70,000 meters. So we're pretty safe. Let's have a look at that fuel level. There you can see we've not got much fuel left. So you may as well just hold prograde at this point and just allow the rest of the fuel in this stage to burn out. And it leaves us with a nice and high apoapsis of about 90,000 meters. So nice and high above the atmosphere gives us plenty of time to circularize. And speaking of circularizing, we could circularize and perform our escape burn from here, but honestly, we don't need to. We're not aiming for any kind of encounter or maneuver or anything like that. So I'm just going to create a maneuver node straight away to get us just out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. We don't need to go very far because the further out we go, the more fuel we have to spend in order to re-enter Kerbin's sphere of influence. So basically just drag it out until you're just leaving and that should be good enough. So only 1200 meters per second, actually it's close to 1300 meters per second for our burn, but we have plenty of fuel here, well over 2000 meters per second in our engine stage there, so it's not a problem. And as always, we want to be starting our burn when the time to maneuver node indicator is about half the time for the burn itself. So we've got a burn of about 1 minute 10 seconds, so I'm going to start burning around 35 seconds before we reach the maneuver node. But things are burning nicely, uh, it's always going pretty smoothly so far. Um, one thing I probably could have changed for the better in this mission is you can see I've brought Bob Kerman along here because Bob he is very good for doing science experiments because he has the ability to restore the science junior and mystery goo experiments which means they can be run multiple times however I'm only going to getting science from space around the sun and then returning straight away so it probably would have been better to bring Jebediah or Valentina just because as pilot kerbals they can create maneuver nodes and do that sort of stuff uh, without needing a connection to the KSC and we are going far and away far far away from the Kerbal Space Center so the onboard communications equipment in our pod won't have a chance in reaching the tracking station. So it might have been useful. We don't ultimately need this feature, but it's something, I don't know, you'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it, I guess. But there we are. We are outside the sphere of influence of Kerbin. Bob has made history. The first Kerbal ever in the history of his planet to, to leave, uh, to enter interplanetary space. He can go on a spacewalk and really soak in that beautiful radiation coming from the sun and then he can focus on doing his experiments so as always run every single piece of science equipment i didn't bring the seismometer with me because that only works if you're landed and we're not going to be able to land anywhere so just took the barometer thermometer mystery goo science junior and of course uh bob Kerman can do an eva report and he can do a crew report as well so we should get lots and lots of science just from these units Speaking of the science we'll get, it would have made far more sense to just have this be an unmanned probe. Just send the probe out and it can transmit all the data back. It would have been a bit more realistic than what we're doing here. And I guess it would have been far easier to do as well. Uh, the reason why I didn't do this is because it wouldn't have yielded enough science to get the 60 points required to unlock the fairing pieces. You get a lot more science for recovering data physically rather than just transmitting it back. So I had to send a Kerbal out on this mission in order to get enough science to unlock the things I wanted to unlock. So the science is all done. The mission main objective is concluded. We now have to focus on getting our brave Kerbal and more importantly, the science back to the Kerbal Space Center, or well, back to Kerbin, and we can just recover it from there. So what I'm going to do, just go to the map screen and set Kerbin as your target by clicking it and pressing set as target. Then just point towards the target node on the nav ball and just keep burning. You'll notice that you kind of get these weird sort of glitching counts with Kerbin and then they disappear and then Kerbin will need to be selected as your target again. So I had to do this kind of a few times in order to make sure our Kerbin encounter was going to occur soon. I didn't want it to just take like a whole year for this mission to uh, run out. So if it's taking like a year to reach your encounter, it means you haven't burned enough. So just keep burning towards your target and you can see those grey target indicators get closer and closer. And we can see our Kerbin encounter eventually fall from <laughs> over 300 days all the way down to mere minutes. That being said, if you weren't as successful in conserving your fuel levels during this mission, then it's not a biggie that you have to wait ages for a Kerbin encounter at the expense of, you know, saving a bit more Delta V. But we've got enough fuel here, we can easily do it. And you can see 
Our payouts this around Kerbin is you know nice and low, and our Kerbin encounter is only 10 minutes away. Beautiful. So Bob can safely uh, know that he is going to get home within the next year. So we can just time warp, I guess, to our Kerbin encounter. And then take a look at our periapsis, make sure it is below 70 kilometers. So not quite that at the moment. So I'm just going to do a retrograde burn to lower our periapsis. I'm aiming for a height of around 40 kilometers, just because it's low enough to create lots of atmospheric drag to slow down to a satisfactory level, but not so low that we'll end up creating too much atmospheric drag and with it too much heating and you know, destroy the capsule and the precious science on board. And I guess Bob as well. <laughs> Now, one thing of note, I did shave off a lot of the ablator from the ablative heat shield just to save a bit of weight and get us a bit more delta V. However, I think I shaved a bit too much off. It wasn't a problem, but we do end up burning off all 80 units from the heat shield. So when it comes to doing it, it's probably not even worth shaving any off because we have so much excessive excess delta V in this craft. We really don't need to do any kind of fuel saving things like removing the ablator. So... I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't copy that aspect of this ship's design. But other than that, I think it's pretty solid. So, here we are. Now, we are coming in very, very, very fast. So, we're actually not going to be able to slow down all the way with this first pass. So, we're going to just lower our apoapsis to quite a low level so that next time we enter the atmosphere, we'll be slowing down and not being flung back out into space. The benefit of this is that we're going to be splashing down in the ocean rather than landing on the ground, which makes the landing a little bit more realistic. Or, you know, at least a bit more in line with the Apollo style landings and I guess all the other NASA landings aside from the space shuttle I suppose. But yeah I might play the footage back a little bit faster now because I feel like I have I've said what I've wanted to say for this mission and I guess you can kind of figure it out. One of the th other criticisms of this series is that I usually play the footage back a little bit faster than real time speed which people said made it too hard to follow. So I've been playing the whole of everything in this episode back at real time speed just to make it nice and easy to uh, follow along with. But I think now we're not actually doing anything. We're just letting gravity do the work. It's not a problem just to let, uh, just speed up the footage a little bit. And there goes the parachute. And we are splashing down in just a second. Uh, I'm using physical time up here just to get ourselves nice and descent. And there we go. Parachute all opened nice and safely. We can just coast the rest of the way down and there we are beautiful landing and bob is happy so we can go we can recover the vessel and go to the r d building and see what we can unlock 168 science points unlocked which gives us plenty of points to play around with so i'm going to unlock the advanced construction node because that's the one that contains the pressure sphere that we need and then we'll just have a look at what else we can get so i thought the propulsion systems one might be useful because we get the slightly smaller diameter fuel tanks but there we go. That's this mission done. So like I say, apologies that it's not like a full mission or anything like that, but it's a nice little easy mission to do to kind of practice getting better at the game. Next week, I hope, we'll be going to Juna or Gilly. Gilly is another place I'd like to visit in this series. So either next week will be Gilly or next week will be Juna. Probably Juna, though, based on how many people wanted me to do Juna. So... Yeah, in case you didn't notice, there are things on screen uh, that'll take you to things like the playlist on the left and the one that was recommended to you by YouTube's algorithm on the right. Thank you for watching, guys, and I hope to see you very soon.